pilot program to strengthen science granting councils on the continent. And this collaborative approach, also collaboration and funding provided by the NRF, Canada's IDRC and UK's different. 16 African science granting councils will participate. This is the first time that a meta program of this level and nature is being instituted. Because the focus will be not only on strengthening the system of grant management and fund expenditure, but a policy component and an impact component to the recipients of the funding. Secondly, co-investment in Africa. There's many science granting councils around the world, officially around 95 or so. This is an example. And each one of them has some program in Africa. What we are currently working on, but what I foresee a major investment scenario in a collaborative way will be in the future, is to co-invest in, in those countries where complementary efforts intersect. This will become increasingly important in future because only national funding and only um, multiple actors working in the same countries on different environments will not add value to an integrated approach. Secondly, also co-investment in Africa. And this example of Euro Africa, Europe Africa research program <coughs> include 17 African and EU countries that will co-invest from their own pockets, fund from their own pockets, and do collaborative research together. There's no external funding provided to this. It was an FP7 program. So this coherence and understanding of own investment is gaining traction. The third part that I would like to mention is what one can call global initiatives. And the examples here, for instance, is the Belmont Forum, which is funded collectively by all of these science granting councils in the world, in excess of 40. The theme is on global change, but this is probably the most prominent example globally currently of how and where science granting councils work together and co-invest for a common purpose. The second one is the Global Research Council, which is a virtual organization established in 2011 by the NSF and currently consists of around 75 leading science granting councils in the world and 17 from the African continent. There's been a great approach in having common statements and implementation frameworks on a variety of topics, including open access, gender, interdisciplinarity, research integrity, capacity development is almost 50 now. And this, I almost want to say, finally provides a good common framework within which to address these often qualitative components when it comes to hardcore science funding. Certainly, we, uh, thirdly, we see this expansion of the so-called economic blocks. And BRICS is a good example for South Africa we passed the political component now. The bank has been established. Finally, the funding has started to flow or devolve to the science granting councils of those five countries for co-investment and co-implementation. MINT has not done it yet, but it is very soon there. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, which is all the countries around the Indian Ocean, is starting to look at a similar model. Fourthly, Jeffrey's example of Monday, the Sustainable Development Network Solutions, is a very, very prominent initiative. I must be honest, I'm waiting to see the results of that, and I'm sure that there are many. But establishing a network is only as good as the results or the impact that it will bring. And the university environment is really a very, very strong um, and forceful sector within which to create a tangible uh, collaborative framework. And very importantly also, this notion of global infrastructure access. Most of the large infrastructure is in the north, and there's many and interesting innovative mobility programs, access, sharing, e-research processes to access that. But there's very, very few, and I think I can count five, um, if you want to describe it as global.
global pieces of infrastructure on the African continent. And I think about 80% of them are in South Africa. That is not equitable, it is not in partnership, and it certainly will not contribute towards the broader research endeavor. And then the fourth one, and this is my great interest, is new granting modalities in a collaborative framework. The Swiss National Science Foundation has pioneered these two notions of money follow follows cooperation line processes and lead agency agreements. And the NRF and many of our collaborative partners are looking at these components where one steps away from a national type of funding framework. That isolation sometimes that your country's borders bring in terms of where money is spent is prohibitive. But the research results and impact usually has direct return on investment on the country. Thirdly, co-investments by philanthropies and national development aids or aid agency. Good. Two excellent examples are the NSF USAID program. So USAID, as you know, is a national aid program of a country. And the NSF is a science granting council. Similarly, RCUK, Gates, and the Wellcome Trust, large co-investment components. Usually the science granting council assists with peer review, expenditure, etc. But that partnership indicates sustainability. It indicates a forward-looking nature and it relieves the pressure of national funding required to only fund the National Science Granting Council. Thirdly, there is a great increase and interest in this notion of research chairs that has been so wonderfully established and, let's say, initiated on a large scale by the Canadian system. They have 1,000 now, South Africa has 201. There's a thousand research chairs in process by the World Bank on the African continent, and it seems that it will never stop. It creates a critical mass of focus, it creates a collaborative framework of training, of engagement, usually multi or interdisciplinary. And this is not new, but the focus and expansion of this notion of research chairs will contribute tremendously. Collaborative frameworks of funding between and among universities and of course the notion of theme-based investment. The International Council for Sciences, um, Future Earth Initiative, um, type of funding that we're looking at, climate change in East Africa, food security in West Africa. Simple examples, but theme-based directed types of investment scenarios and horizons that extends the focus and hopefully have a stronger component on impact. Well, it's in conclusion, you know this notion of collaboration partnerships sounds almost like a cliche already. Everyone says this for the past two decades. But if ever it was strategic and important, it is now. Finally, and maybe the realization has been there a few years ago, Many African countries has realized that it cannot invest on its own. And the partnership from an African perspective should not only come from give me the money and we can be partners. It should be equal and there should be co-investment from both sides to make it more equal. And that environment, especially with SDG 17, will be what is one of the success factors from a developing country point of view. I'm coining Jeff's term that he used Monday, ecosystems of university-led development. University networks with national funding agencies are very few and far between. Remember, because the university is usually the recipient. But if one thinks of a collaborative network that's strong, that's directed, that uses the depth and scholarly drive of universities and the higher education system, there are many arguments to strengthen this notion of a true partnership between the funder and the usual receiver. Thirdly, commitment by governments is key and critical. The sustainability of that commitment, a long-term funding view, and not differentiating budgets as we go year on year, as we have unfortunately many examples of those um, on the African continent. What is important is not just more money, it is an understanding of the policy environment 
or should I say politicians, of what the value of research is, what the value of science is, what is a knowledge economy. Research is not a nice to have. It is not something to keep the universities alive while you're doing the base responsibility of teaching the next generation. It is an integrated endeavor that should be understood at the highest levels and really linked from research to science to policy perspective. There was focus on emerging economies. And one of the reasons this sometimes is not so successful is because of these two determining factors. Our portfolio committee on science and technology, which is the parliamentary oversight component for science funding in South Africa, then I have to do a long presentation on how much capacity we built, what is the research success. And the first question from one of the members is, so how many jobs did you create? Very valuable question. We don't know what to say. Our business is not job creation, but that is the expectation, that is the return on investment that the developing country context usually is after. But an understanding of the impact of research on components like job creation, welfare, um, improved quality of life should be understood in an integrated way in order for the developing context to move forward and invest enough. I want to go as far to mention a component of curriculum reform. There's, outside of this type of the 